Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we'll be discussing why it's so important that Christians stand up for Israel but also stand up for the persecuted church in the Middle East. Well, welcome to the programme. And uh, today we have a very special guest on the Middle East Report. He needs no introduction. His name's uh, David Hathaway, the founder and director of uh, Eurovision. Uh, David, it's an uh, absolute pleasure to have you uh, back on the Middle East Report. Well, thank you, Simon. I always enjoy these programmes because we've both got a great love for Israel and want to share that. Absolutely. Now, what's so remarkable about you, David, is the fact that uh, you're 87 years uh, old and, or I should say young in your case, um, <laughs> you are so passionate and enthusiastic, not only about spreading the gospel, but also um, discussing the spiritual implications of Brexit, uh, as well as standing up for Israel and the Jewish people. Where do you get the strength from? <laughs> Apart um, from yeah. It's difficult to know, but I suppose part of the strength comes from a very deep conviction in my heart. I mean, this has been in me since my earliest days. God really touched me in my childhood. And um, so, yes, it, it, it's just got to come out. And also, the other thing is, is I feel in some issues, while the church can be technically correct, they're too lukewarm in expressing it. And I think in face of what's going on in the world and the opposition, especially the anti-Semitism, we've got to speak out. Absolutely. But um, Dave, do you want to share with us uh, when the Lord gave you a love and heart for Israel and the Jewish people? Well, I've always been uh, loved Israel. My, my father actually wrote books on prophecy, although he never actually visited Israel. And um, the thing which really started me was 1961. I was a young evangelist opening churches. And um, when I heard that there was to be a World Pentecostal Conference in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people were coming from all over the world, I said, I have to be there, and I had no money. Anyway, I set up an overland expedition. I was the first person ever to make the overland crossing. But it took me through, not only into Israel, but through so many of the Middle East countries. And that was opening me up. And from that moment, I became so involved. I was on the board of uh, an Israeli mission, and I, technically I was the ambassador, always the liaison between the two. But the more I was there, the more I loved Israel and saw God calling me to the nation. So it began 1961. Fabulous. So let's have a look at uh, this excellent video produced by uh, David uh, that is called 1961 Israel Expedition. David Hathaway started to work in Eastern Europe and Russia in 1961, when he was just 29. He led the first modern overland group expedition to Jerusalem, travelling by road behind the Communist Iron Curtain and through hostile Middle Eastern countries. The group set off to attend a World Pentecostal Conference in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, but everyone from motoring organisations to take the British Foreign Office said they were mad. They were not allowed to take women on the trip due to the perceived dangers. In addition to the hazards of crossing Iron Curtain countries on unknown roads without suitable hotels, they were told that in Turkey they would be killed by bandits and in Syria shot as spies. What was the point of going all that way to Jerusalem? Why go to all that trouble and cause so many people such trouble? Are you mad? <laughs> Well, uh, some people might uh, try to suggest I was mad, but there was a reason for it. You see, I'd heard that there was to be a conference in Jerusalem of all Pentecostal people from all over the world, and it was to be held on the day of Pentecost. 
Now, I believe from Bible prophecy that in these last days before the return of Christ, the Bible says that there is going to be another outpouring greater than on the day of Pentecost. And I believe that if I would go to Jerusalem, it would happen. Now, I didn't have the money. I was a young evangelist in England. I was married with two young children. I didn't have the money to go the way the others went and pay for an airfare. And the only way I could see that I could do it, literally, was to set up an expedition to take a group in a minibus, and of course, because I was organizing it, the others would pay and I would go for free. That's what happened. But the tragedy is that I got there. And when I got there, the conference was such that, that I did not receive what I was expecting to receive. And so really, I was very disappointed over this because I didn't get what I was expecting to get. But now when I look back, I realize that what happened changed my whole life. This was the beginning of the change that was to turn me from being just a British evangelist to becoming what I am now, which is a, an evangelist, particularly in Russia and the communist countries. Because going there, firstly, I had to travel behind the Iron Curtain in those days, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, and then of course in the other countries like Syria and Jordan. But it opened my eyes to the conditions. This was, remember, this was 1961, when the Cold War was at its height. And that touched my heart and opened my eyes to what was going on. And it was the beginning of the change in my life. Absolutely extraordinary. Um, David, that was an extraordinary journey that, that you undertook. Um, what were some of the challenges? Because not only did you have to drive through some of these Soviet bloc countries that um, didn't allow kind of Westerners through, you also then had to drive through Turkey, which was hostile to Israel, but more importantly, Syria, and going through Damascus to get to, to Israel as well. So, um, yeah, what were you thinking at the time to do this? It's uh, definitely a leap of faith, that's for sure. Well, it was a tremendous leap of faith. And when I look back over those years now, because, I mean, it's nearly 60 years, uh, I wonder why I did it. But it's, I've always been driven by vision. And I had such a vision of what God would do in my life if I could get there. And so the journey was almost irrelevant. The whole thing was I had to be in Jerusalem. I did need a new baptism of fire. But it was exciting. Um, yes, in, in one sense, one could say I've been a Christian adventurer because I've done the things that other people don't know, whether it was going to Jerusalem or whether it was taking 400 people to Siberia when Russia was on the point of collapse. Uh, and one has to be a pioneer. And what we desperately need in Christian faith is a, a, a new sense that the early apostles had of that pioneering spirit. And come on, we need that today. Absolutely. And that's what inspired me. Yeah. So what was it like when you actually drove into Damascus? Because uh, obviously relations between Israel and uh, Syria at the time were incredibly hostile um, and it would have been very difficult. How did you manage to cross the border? I mean, that's, well, that's the biggest question that comes to mind. Yeah, well, it was crossing into Syria. It wasn't Damascus itself. It was, yes, we were in Damascus, but it was the fact that I had been told if they found on us anything containing the word Israel, we would be shot. So we had to have two passports, two sets of car documents. In those days, you had to have a car name for the car. And the word Israel had to be totally obliterated. And then we had a second set, which were only valid in Israel, and we had to hide them. They took us out of the bus, put us against a wall, lined us up looking as if they were going to shoot us. They started to ask questions. But fortunately, the major thing was the whole theme of the journey was overland to Jerusalem. We never mentioned Israel. If you look at picture, the clip oh, of the yes, back of the yes. bus, it was always Jerusalem. Jerusalem was in Jordan. Yes. In those days, um, you still had the wall there. And Jerusalem was partitioned. So although the conference was in Israel, so we actually were going to Jerusalem in Jordan. 
Amazing. And where was the conference? Was it on the Jordan side or the Israeli side? No, it's on the Israeli side. So uh, what you could do is, and this was the, 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 the difficulty, of course, getting visas to go through the communist countries in 1961. In Bulgaria, they virtually put us in prison overnight. And even now, when I go back, everybody knows, oh, yes, we know the prison you were in. They take me to see it, of course. But having got into Jordan, the Jordanian Danians, for the purposes of tourism, allowed a one-way crossing. So once you'd gone into Israel, you couldn't go back. Now, that was a problem until I discovered we could get out by sea from Haifa, so we sailed from Haifa back into, actually into Athens, and then drove up from there. So God always made a way. It took me two years to plan it, but you can learn a tremendous amount. Every obstacle the enemy threw at me, God always made a way where there is no way. Absolutely inspirational. So let's have a look now and look back at uh, the extraordinary ministry of David Hathaway over those 87 years. I've always heard God. Go this way. Go this way. Do this. Do this. Do this. Always all my life. The voice of God is behind me. There you go, and you can uh, get your own copy of uh, David's autobiography, looking back at uh, 87 incredible years of uh, ministry for the Lord. Um, David, you're one of these privileged people that uh, are part of that World War II generation. Um, but also not only that, that you were around uh, when the modern state of Israel was declared on the 14th of May, 1948. Um, what was your reaction when you saw Bible prophecy coming to life when the nation of Israel was declared back in 1948? Well, it was a tremendous experience because we were so, even at that stage, involved. And by the way, I, I spent most of the war, I was eight when the war started, or seven and a half when the war started. Although we were in London and the bombs were falling, I wasn't praying against the bombs. I was praying for revival, for the Holy Spirit to come to London. And significantly, where I pray today are big churches of a thousand people. So, in 1948, I never forget that day, my father bursting into my bedroom, David, now we have the state of Israel. So right from the beginning, I was involved in Israel. So my heart was for the nation. But uh, that's why I, I, I became so involved. And even now, although as you've seen in those clips, my ministry since Israel has taken me so much into the communist states and uh, uh, there isn't time to tell you here what the miracles that God has done. Do you know even at government level, in Moscow two years ago, the advisor to Putin said to me, David, it was your preaching the gospel when, so when the Soviet Union collapsed 30 years ago that saved Russia from chaos. Now that's at Putin level. So you can see what God has done. But I've never, ever lost that love for Israel. I mean, I set up a travel company taking the people in because of my love for Israel. And we're going up to eight times a year. I got a fleet of buses. Of course, that's how we did the Bible smuggling, but that's a, another issue. So I was Bible smuggling on the way out and then going into Israel. But it, it just developed such a love, watching Israel grow. I mean, I've seen it grow from 13 years old to now over 70 years old. And I never fail to be impressed with the fact that 
Israel is the only democracy in the whole Middle East. Israel is the only place where every religious group can live together. Muslims and Christians and Jews can live together in absolute harmony and peace. So Israel is a lesson. Look, we've got to, we've got to shout this out. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. And if the Middle East could be modeled, the whole of the Middle East could be modeled on the on what Israel is, then the kingdom of God could come. And uh, despite all the criticisms of Israel, it's absolute rubbish. If you go there, I mean, I can remember when so much of the biblical territory was, was, was under the Muslims. You see, Jerusalem was divided. And we would go through Syria. Oh yeah, don't talk about Syria. Syria was uh, quite a, a place. Christians were there. You see? Then we go through Jordan and then into Israel. But the contrast, even after 13 years, the contrast from coming from the Arab countries into Israel was a revelation because the Israelis love their own land. That's the thing. So it's a tremendous experience. Uh, and what was it like being there for the first time, knowing that where you were, you, 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 you were around when uh, the state of Israel was recreated back in the 14th of May 1948. You went to Israel for the first time in 1961. You saw Israel for itself. Um, what was your initial feeling of being in the land and knowing that this land is here because of the promises made to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, but also uh, prophecies fulfilled by the likes of Ezekiel and, and, and Daniel and Zechariah and all these great prophets of the Old Testament? Well, the, the excitement was that having read the Bible from cover to cover, having grown up on the Bible, to actually see it come to life, that's what uh, helped to form me, uh, challenge my evangelism, to see that it, the, the Bible wasn't just a book, but it was an actual historical record. And here I was walking on those streets. Jesus comes alive. Uh, I remember the first time going to the, the garden tomb, seeing Calvary, because where we believe Calvary was his bus station, as it still is, <laughs> but to actually see it. And so I, I, I wanted to take people and Really, it, it grew from 1961 into a mission to take people to Israel. At that time, I didn't even see my ministry in the communist countries. I saw the ministry to take young people. I even took a, a busload of non-Christian school kids and showing them, look, this is, this is the Bible come to life. You know, the Bible is true because you can see it all here, all the evidence. So. It drove this home. And then, of course, I met up with key people who were able to show me and explore some of the background. I mean, even things like, I, I, I was very friendly in those days with a man called L.T. Pearson. He died many, many years ago. He'd spent, uh, during the First World War, he, he lived in Israel when it was under, under the Turks. And he knew so much. I mean, he took, he took me to Mount Carmel and showed me the place where the fire fell in Elijah's day, picked up the piece of blue stone, which the atomic research station said was only formed by atomic power. So the fire that fell on Mount Carmel was atomic power. And all this was burning into my spirit. This God, the God of Israel, is so much greater than anyone can ever imagine. Wow. Absolutely, wow. Um, David, uh, when we kind of reflect on the relationship, how important has that evangelical Christian support been for the nation of Israel over the decades? Well, it's been critical. And critical, I'm going to say something here that might, uh, that might be surprise you. It's critical because most people in the whole of that region see the Catholic Church as representing the Christian. And I know, because the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church between them bought up most of the land. In fact, the land on which the Knesset is built is owned by the Catholic Church, and the lease runs out shortly. And so what I saw was that the Catholic Church actually had an intention to rule Jerusalem. And God has prevented that. 
But now it's the rise of the evangelicals there. And this is only quite recent. I mean, when I was growing in 1961, there were very few evangelicals going. The Messianic people hadn't come. There were no Messianic Jews. So virtually it was Judaism against Catholicism and Orthodoxy. So what I've seen, Simon, it's quite interesting, I've seen the actual progression of the evangelical Christians into the land. Until today, they are the force. They are the ones that are, are, are dealing with it there. Netanyahu never speaks about the Catholic Church. He speaks about the evangelical church. And it's the evangelical church that has revolutionized Israel. And our acceptance, our support, without our support, I don't think Israel would be in the position she's in today. Incredible. Uh, and how has Christian support, particularly evangelical Christian support, transformed and, and put Israel in the place that she is today? Well, largely because, uh, particularly, I, I must admit in this case, America has a, has, has a big influence because until relatively recently, Christians were a large force in, in, in America. I mean, still are, but they're not so dominant. And so, uh, and uh, America was more evangelical. So it was American support that changed things. But not only that, but you see the garden tomb. It's called Gordon's Calvary because it was General Gordon in, uh, after 1917 that discovered that. And in actual fact, there is a museum in Jerusalem, which I've only just recently seen, it's only recently been opened, which actually shows and lists all the British men and women <laughs> who were involved in the formation of Israel as it is today. And it's phenomenal. Even non-Christians were involved in the creation of what we understand as the state of Israel. Um, just going on to a, a, a related subject, uh, and that is that uh, Israel's current Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, who um, has currently now, is currently now, sorry, the longest serving Israeli Prime Minister in Israel's history. And he, more than any other of his predecessors, has cultivated Christian support for Israel. Um, why do you think he's done this? I think he's done it, to me, I think he's done it because from the moment of Trump's in, uh, inception as, uh, as president, he was surrounded by evangelical Christians. And you know that they prayed over him. And in a sense, I think Trump is dependent on the support of evangelical Christians. It, America is divided over him. But despite his character, um, he does allow the, the evangelicals and support the evangelicals. And he actually, just as Israel needs evangelical Christians, I'm going to say this, and you may be surprised, your viewers may be surprised. I think Trump remains in power because of evangelical Christians, because they're praying over him. Look, I don't like all that he does, but Trump has done what he says. He's a break away from the tradition of politicians. He never was a politician, he's a businessman. And we've needed that kind of revolution to change politics. I'm actually praying that Boris Johnson will do the same <laughs> in Britain. And I'm going to say here, I think it's a challenge. I've got a, you know, a National Day of Prayer on the 31st of August. I'm going to invite Boris Johnson to come Fabulous. and pray over him. And um, please, if you're watching, pray that he will respond and come, that we can pray over him in the way that evangelicals have prayed over Trump. And so what I'm saying is this, evangelical Christians have influenced, even through Trump, what's happened in Israel. Do you see what I'm saying? It's the link it goes back to evangelical Christians. Absolutely. So let's have a look now at uh, Israel's Prime Minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, welcoming uh, Christian friends to Jerusalem. My wife, Sarah, and I are delighted to be with you in Brazil. We have no better friends in the world than the evangelical community. And the evangelical community has no better friend in the world than the state of Israel. None. 
If you're a Christian in the Middle East, there's only one place where you're safe. There's only one place where the Christian community is growing, thriving, prospering. That's in the state of Israel. Because everywhere else, if you're a Christian, you have to be very careful or you have to leave. Not in Israel. You are our brothers and our sisters and we protect the rights of Christians as we protect the rights of all religions. But this isn't only a matter of, uh, of justice and it's not only a matter of uh, a value. It's a matter of the deepest sympathy in recognizing our common traditions, our common heritage. We know that uh, Christianity grew out of Judaism. From that same tiny land, this barren piece of land at the edge of Asia, that a great story and a great message for all humanity emerged. Now, sometimes people want to hide it. Or sometimes they don't want to reveal it. So I want to tell you a story. When I was first elected in 1996, believe it or not, this is my fourth term in office. So I've been around. Now we're going for the Khamsa. We're going for number five. But in my first term, 1996, shortly after I was elected, I invited the then Prime Minister of Turkey to Israel to come and visit Sarah and me with his wife. We had very good relations with Turkey in those days. We had economic relations, defense relations, intelligence relations, everything, and cultural relations, but not that much. Well, we had dinner, and after dinner, I said to uh, my friend, I have a request. You have in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul this tablet. This tablet was found in the 19th century by an American archaeologist in the tunnel dug by King Hezekiah under Jerusalem. It's written in the Bible. He wanted to secure the water sources of Jerusalem against a Babylonian siege and or an Assyrian siege and he built this tunnel. And when the two teams of diggers met, they heard each other's pickaxes. And at the place where they met, they put this tablet, which is about the size that you see it, written in ancient Hebrew. And it says the story, the story from the Bible. Look at what it says. I can't see it. On the day of the tunnel being finished, the stone cutters struck each man towards his counterpart, axe. Axe against axe, and the water flowed from the source to the pool. You know which pool? This is the pool of Silwam, where 700 years later Jesus went in Jerusalem. This tunnel, this tablet, tells a story from the Bible. It's probably the most Impressive archaeological find, uh, except for the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, Dead Sea Scrolls, and it's actually 700 years earlier. So I said, uh, I have a proposal for you, Mr. Prime Minister. We have many, many artifacts, Ottoman period artifacts, because Turkey controlled uh, our land for 400 years, you know. Sometimes I think they forget that they don't control it anymore, but we remind them. And I said, we have so many artifacts in our museum. Choose any artifact you want, and I will give it to you. And he said, I cannot do that. I said, uh, okay, I have another proposal for you, because I want this tablet from the Bible. I will give you all the artifacts we have in our museums. That's hundreds and hundreds of artifacts. He said, sorry, I cannot do it. I said, you know what? I'll give you 
a hundred million dollars if you give me that stone tablet. He said, I'm sorry, I cannot do it. I said, I have another proposal for you. Choose any price you want. Name any price you want, and I'll meet it. And he said, I'm sorry, I cannot do it. My friend, he said, I cannot do it for a very simple reason. I understand and I sympathize with what you want to do. But we have a large Islamic community in Turkey that has since taken over Turkey. And if I were to give this to you, this would be an admission of a truth that many in my country don't want to admit, that Jerusalem has been your capital for 3,000 years, that Zion is the capital of the people of Israel. Well, you don't need that reminder, do you? You know Israel and Jerusalem are one. And Jerusalem from the time of King David, 300 years before King Hezekiah, was the capital of our people, has remained the capital of our people, and will remain the united, eternal capital of the Jewish people for all time. Uh, which is absolutely incredible, which uh, really does uh, show that uh, Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel and the Jewish people, and the Bible is true. Uh, David, what do you, do you make of that extraordinary uh, speech and presentation by Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu? Oh, well, that's, that's phenomenal because it, it's supporting not only Israel, but also the Bible as being the authority, not not just parts, the Bible being the authority behind Israel. I find that's phenomenal. I've never heard that before. That's incredible. Excellent. And um, David, Benjamin Netanyahu has gone on to win uh, five, five terms in mm. office. Um, sadly, at the moment, he couldn't form uh, a coalition government, which means that uh, come the 17th of September, Israel has to have uh, new elections. But before that, we have to ask, why do you think that Benjamin Netanyahu has been so successful as uh, Israel's Prime Minister? Well, I, I'm absolutely convinced that his success is his support of Christians, of evangelical Christians, and the authority of the Bible. So, um, I believe we've got to pray him back in, because I fear, no, I fear for the future of Israel if we lose a Bible-believing, Christian-supporting, Premier. But also, I think one thing with um, Bibi Netanyahu um, is the fact that he recognises that the entire support base, as you mentioned earlier, for President Trump comes from evangelical Christians. And uh, he knew that evangelical Christians um, were supporting the Senate and the Congress, so he could use that as leverage against President Obama, particularly with the Iran deal and others, where he actually went um, to speak directly to Congress rather than actually to the President in order to win the support of Congress. Um, and that doesn't, doesn't that show us the power of how Christians have got involved in politics, particularly in the States and the difference it makes in terms of aligning the United States with, uh, with, with Israel, which is God's main foreign policy, um, and, and also which brings a curse or a blessing. In this case, it brings a blessing if we look at Genesis 12, uh, verse 3. But then combine that with the fact is that once you have uh, congressmen who have a love for Israel and the Jewish people and senators as well who are Bible-believing Christians, they bring a kind of righteousness to government and they prevent ungodly laws and ungodly rulers uh, in. So why is politics and the support of Israel so important for, for Christians? Well, uh, it, it's important because what it's demonstrating is that when Christians are at prayer, and when they unite, they can influence and change the whole political situation. And I'll give you another illustration just briefly, what God has done for us in Kiev, where by uniting every Christian denomination in a day of prayer, it involved the Prime Minister, the President, until the President of the Ukraine declared 2018 the year of the Bible. That's a former ungodly, atheistic 
communist nation. What we've got to understand is that we as Christians have got to stand together in a lot more unity and we've got to pray a lot harder and evangelicals in Britain have got to begin to stand up for what they believe in. And I, I, I feel this so passionately. And it, it's got to be reflected in what God is doing in Israel. And I believe what God is doing in Israel, God can do in Britain, the two elite. And if you look, there's no single nation in the world that's been so involved with Israel. It's not America, it's Britain. It's this nation. And yet, this nation is divided over Israel. What I'm finding is anti-Semitism, replacement theology in the church. And, um, I, you know, I was there in the Six-Day War, 1967. I had to evacuate two groups, one on either side of the border. When the peace came, the Israeli government invited me back in because I was a big tour operator. And I went with a group of British people and I was shocked by the Christians in the group with me who supported the Palestinians against Israel even immediately after the Six Day War. And I'm sorry, Simon, but we have got to root out some of Absolutely. the anti-Israel feeling even amongst Christians. And that's where evangelicals must stand up and come to the front. And how is, um, when we're talking spiritually, how is supporting Israel, praying for Israel, blessing the nation of Israel key to kind of revival in this country and, and a spiritual awakening within the churches? Well, the scripture is very clear. Those, God blesses those who bless Israel. And so our blessing is dependent on our relationship. And so, yes, we want that blessing, but we've got to bless Israel as a people. And uh, I don't think we can say that anyone else has blessed Israel more than uh, Nikki Haley, who was uh, America's ambassador to the United Nations, where she showed bravery and courage by standing up for Israel time and time again in the UN, uh, despite the fact the entire nations were against us. So let's see uh, Nikki Haley being welcomed and uh, in a meeting with Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife Sarah. Hello. Hi, Hi, how are you? How are you? Welcome. So nice welcome. to see you. Thank you. Welcome. So good to see you. It's so happy to meet you. It's so nice to finally see you. Exactly. Every time that I miss you, you go. Pleasure. I'm delighted to receive uh, the Haley's here and to say that uh, Sarah and I not only appreciate your friendship in this visit, but also the entire people of Israel appreciate the extraordinary way that you represented our alliance between America and Israel and the way you defended Israel and the truth, which is the same thing in the UN. You, you are a great champion of uh, this alliance and uh, you have the enduring gratitude of all the people of Israel. I'm not just saying this, I really mean it. Mm -hmm. It's really, really it's really heartfelt. Thank you. Thank you. And I can tell you that um, on behalf of our family, thank you for your hospitality and friendship. But more than that, thank you for your partnership. There have been some really great things between um, these two administrations and it's forever bonded us. And we look forward to many, many more years of strength and partnership between Israel and the United States. Well, we agree with that, for and sure. And with that, I'd love to give you a gift right oh, now. Oh, fine, yeah, fine. Because it is very close to the Is it recognition of the Golan? Uh, it is um, something we had for you, my friend. Wow. Um, it's the resolution that was my first veto. Oh. And if you'll see, it says a moment of truth. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. There's one more principle I knew before I arrived at the UN. Like most Americans, I knew what the capital of Israel was. To be more clear, 
I knew that Jerusalem was, is, and will always be the capital of Israel. This is not something that was, I love you too. <laughs> this was not something that was created by the location of an embassy. This is not something that was created by an American decision. America did not make Jerusalem Israel's capital. What President Trump did, to his great credit, was recognize a reality that American presidents had denied for too long. <laughs> Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, that's a fact. And President Trump had the courage to recognize that fact when others would not. Sometime in the future, the day will come when the whole world recognizes that fact. In the meantime, I hope, you, I hope to be there and join our great ambassador, David Friedman. on the day when we open our brand new American Embassy in Jerusalem. Uh, truly inspirational woman who uh, stood up for Israel on the world stage and uh, defended uh, the one and only uh, democratic state in the Middle East, that is Israel. Um, now, David, doesn't that show what uh, Christian beliefs can achieve? The, to have a heart and a passion for Israel and the Jewish people built on a biblical foundation that uh, we see with Nikki Haley. She went on to become uh, America's ambassador to the UN and defended uh, Israel in the UN. Uh, show us something or tell us something about um, how that God has a special plan and, and purpose for people if only they open their hearts to what God is wanting to do. Well, obviously, this is in God's heart that we, we follow this. And I believe Israel is key because, after all, Jerusalem is going to be the capital of the world. Jesus rules the world from Jerusalem. Amen. And I'm very interested because I'm quite amazed, having watched the development of Israel over the past 60 years, to see all the new road systems and everything, it's as if, in my mind, it's as if Jerusalem is being prepared as an international capital for the world. And I've, I've had meetings in the Knesset, I've met with a number, of, uh, in fact, after my big meetings in Caesarea, I had a meeting with the Deputy Speaker of the Knesset, who really gave me a letter of appreciation for what I'd done. And in fact, a former chief rabbi came from Tel Aviv, threw his arms around me and said, thank you for what you've done for Israel. Because, you see, even in my life, even in my life, I believe the blessing of my life, the, the blessing of my ministry, wherever it is, has come through my relationship with Israel. And that's why God said to me, you began in Israel and you will end in Israel. And I, 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 I'm looking forward to the relationship with our new government in Britain Absolutely. to recognize Israel. And if you watch, because the Labour Party have uh, turned totally anti-Semitic, I mean they have, they don't deny it, they can't get rid of it, they will be destroyed. And if our government supports Israel, God will honor them and bless them. But we as evangelical Christians have got to stand up in this country and make a strong statement. Absolutely. And when it comes down to Christians in the Middle East, um, you know, it, it, the only safe place for Christians in the Middle East is Israel. And uh, sadly, Christians in the Middle East face um, horrendous genocide. So in the last five minutes of the program, uh, as Christians in the West, what, we can, what can we do to support those Christians that uh, are facing um, unbelievable persecution in the Middle East today? 
the first thing, of course, we can do is pray. And I think we do spend a lot of need to spend time in prayer. But you've also got to recognize that the Christians who are being beheaded are not all evangelical Christians. And I think we've got to remember that there are other people who respect and call upon the name of Jesus and worship him, although it may be different to us, if they do, and if they are persecuted, they need our support and our prayers. And I think we've got to make a big issue of this, a, a much stronger issue, because I've seen the absolute decimation of, of Christians. Uh, you know, they're, they're fleeing. And something has to change in Britain, because I know that we have rejected some Christian refugees who sought to come into our country because of Christian persecution. And I'm praying, and I think we need to pray, that the government, the new government, will take a different attitude to Christian refugees as opposed to Muslim refugees. We have to make Britain a place which receives them. They have to understand Christian is a home for Christian refugees wherever they're from. Absolutely. Also, uh, David, it's so important, is it, that um, the... ISIS terrorists who were responsible for horrendous acts of genocide against the uh, Christians in Iraq and also in Syria and also against the Yazidis are brought to tr uh, justice and actually face trial in The Hague uh, for acts of genocide. How important is it that governments around the world act um, and, and, and actually demonstrate uh, through the legal means that, that what ISIS did was, was horrific and therefore they need to be held to account? Well, it's got to come through prayer. And, and in fact, what you're saying, I think we're going to have to make a major point in our prayer meeting on the 31st of um, August because the EU supports the terrorists. The EU is funding the terrorists who blow themselves up and money. So, in effect, the European Union is technically against Israel supports the enemies of Israel. We've got to challenge us, and it's one of the reasons we have to come out of the EU. Because in Britain we support Israel, but the other countries don't. And we've got to make this a real matter of prayer, that God will change the attitude. Because, Simon, what you're saying is right. These terrorists should be brought to justice. Absolutely. But we've got to pray into this issue. Uh David, come down to the last few minutes of the program, probably less than that, but yeah, you're 87 now. What uh, word of advice have you got for us, how we can maintain our, our faith and our passion in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and defend Israel and the Jewish people? Well, the first thing is this, it's, part of, it's to do with your prayer life, but it's what you believe in your heart. I mean, I, I'm passionate about what I believe in. I don't care what age I am. The passion grows. And I want to see more emotion and more passion and more enthusiasm in the church. We become too placid, too... I mean, we're taught, you know, it's important to be quiet and be calm and, you know, be at peace. No, we've got to realize the church is actually at war. No, the church is at war against unbelief and ungodliness and... The challenge that we're seeing today is that we're fighting a battle, and it's a battle which will only be resolved when Christ gets back. So the battle we're in, Simon, is to speed the return of Jesus. Come on, let's get up, let's stand up for what we believe in, let's pray over it, let's believe it, and let's declare it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, David Hathaway, absolute pleasure to have you on the Middle East Report today. And I pray that God gives you an extra 20 years because... We, 30. We, a, extra 30 years. <laughs> so we need more men like you uh, standing for the truth. And I just want to thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East Report. You can see with David's passion how important Israel is to David, but it's also so important to God. And uh, if we want to have that blessing, we want to see the Lord move powerfully in our own nation here in Britain, then we stand with Israel and we pray for Israel and we pray for the Jewish people. So I'll leave you with this beautiful song uh, from Jerusalem, from the old city, and this is where Yeshua HaMashiach is returning. So thank you for watching today's Middle East Report. The one who comes a raging storm One who walks upon the sea 
earth and heaven on your own Yet you're watching over me Yo